No, right. All right. Master James. Master Joe Sidon. Actually, someone asked recently if uh, they said, so is your teacher, Joseph, is he a master as well? Because I was saying, you know, the masters I mentioned, uh, you know, the masters of Adanta something, you know. Um, and uh, should be stated, uh, as you rightfully always call out, we actually have no clue what the masters think, do, go through. It's The master is a realized soul. So it's uh, until you're there, we have no idea what we're talking about when we refer to it, but it's still always part of the discussion. To Heck yeah. Reference point. But, yeah. But yeah, they asked if you're a master, do you mind going through uh, the levels or lack thereof within Vedanta Vedanta Academy? Because I think so many folks are used to, oh, there's, whether it's, you know, cardinals and bishops in any hierarchical structures in the West, or it's like reishis and... Mm. Uh, Rinpoche's. Mm -hmm. Is there any of that in Vedanta? I know the answer, but yeah, no, there's nothing in Vedanta Academy like that. There's no, there's students and there's Swamiji. Everyone else is there's Swamiji, and everyone else is a student. And even he never sought the name Swami or right. Uh, and like we were saying, I don't know if that was on Clubhouse. We were mentioning if you're if you're with Swamiji. Um. Uh, you go to a meeting or, or or whatever, just with people out in the world with Swamiji. He'll introduce us as his colleagues, <laughs> which is like a little bit hard to take. You know, you want to be, you know, but whatever. You don't want to disagree with him, you know. But mm -hmm. uh, these are my colleagues, or one of my colleagues can help you. And you're just like, please, Swamiji, you don't. <laughs> it's just kind of, a, you know, um, I don't know you. It's slightly uncomfortable. Sorry, guys. It's like a dean with a first week freshman just being like, these are my colleagues. And you're like, I just got here. I don't Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no. we, we There's no such thing. There's no external, um, you know, ladder, mm. uh, corporate ladder situation in the ashram. There's no such thing. There's There's... The teacher and then there's all the students who are there that's it there's it's in that way um natural informal there's um there's no thousands of years of traditional ways of promoting people and and whatnot mm. but you know there are natural um uh roles that people play that happen when a group of people live together in a community like that for sure I was thinking today's conversation uh, could could center on and and for folks uh, watching us, we might record a few today. Yeah, and so if you see us wearing the same clothes, it's because we're we're knocking out a few episodes. Probably too much for for the average listener to want to take in. Um, so we'll split it up for you. But this yeah. is how uh, some of the days go with with us with you. Yeah, it is several hours uh, straight. But uh, the I'd love for this conversation, I'd love to go over maybe the history of Vedanta, broad strokes, but for folks to get a sense for time and and place where it orients in the in the Eastern, you know, philosophical viewpoints. We've touched on it in previous episodes here and there, uh, and for anyone listening that wants the broad overview of Vedanta, episode one is perfect for that. Mm. What is Vedanta? But the historical side of things. And then all the way to a little bit of, of also we've touched on how the ashram runs today, but kind of then culminating with a little bit about life in the ashram, because I think we all bring so much baggage to what an ashram or a monastery or religion mm. or even uh, a deep philosophy can be. Mm. And I have found Vedanta to be some, none, all, it, of, of parts of these mm. but very distinct but maybe broad strokes could you give a little bit of where vedanta started um and a little bit of the win and not like a, this doesn't even be a scholastic endeavor mm. for our listeners but just for them to have some orientation so vedanta is sanatana dharma eternal principles vedanta itself is beginningless 
and endless. It's the the laws that govern life. Mm. So there's no beginning. It didn't start anywhere. But recently, uh, recently in the past five to ten thousand years, um, <laughs> uh, there was an oral tradition where great masters who realized these laws of life uh, were teaching them in a in an oral tradition. Um, Somebody started writing them down. I don't know. And the oral tradition could have been just someone in a cave that gets a little bit of a reputation of being extremely wise. And a young a young Turk from the neighboring village starts to try to go visit with them and has some pull to wanting to learn from from that wise person. And there's no... There's no rituals around it. There's no like we already touched on. There's no, I wouldn't like, say there's no rituals. There there might have been a lot of okay, rituals. Okay, but, but yeah. not necessarily like a, a vertical institution of like this part person is part of. No, no, it's X. not like here's my application and here's my acceptance letter and now mm-hmm. I'm gonna go. Stay. No, it's just this person has a degree from or has been uh, canonized by X. Just natural organic um, growth of teacher student relationships. Which has been going on uh, on the subcontinent for forever, basically. Um, so it got to really just simplify and generalize. It, it slowly began to be written down, and uh, the Vedas were, of course, the um, the famous four textbooks that. Uh, not only Vedanta, but all types of knowledge of life was contained in, written in, recorded in, all kinds of stuff. How to cook, how to eat, how to indulge. I mean, remedies for an illness. Not necessarily good, not necessarily saying it's uh, good or bad, just this is how you do stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is what we know about life. Um, so, a small portion of the Vedas are Vedanta, is this philosophy. And um, those are those books are called Upanishads, and they're one-to-one conversations between a master and a student, talking about the highest truths exclusively. Those books are not; they're only talking about the absolute. They're not. They're not talking about relationships and stress and strain and productivity and all these things, which are fine and they're great on ramps for our life in the world now, but those guys were not interested. They were only talking about enlightenment, the state of spiritual enlightenment. That's it. That That's all it was. And over time, those very terse, very uh, cryptic, highly concentrated conversations. Because some of them could be 20 verses or 80 verses. Yeah. Extremely short. Extremely short. And if you read them, directly with that especially without any commentary like what is this it almost sounds like some kind of gibberish Mm -hmm. um it has to be interpreted by master a teacher who knows what is being said in those words so that those texts were elaborated upon for thousands of years through other texts the bhagavad gita is came along thousands of years later and is elaborates on a lot of those ideas from the Upanishads. In fact, some of the verses in the Gita are direct lifts. They lift entire verses out of the Upanishads. For listeners, can you give an, an example of a line from an Upanishad where 19-year-old James would read it without the context and be like, I have no idea what that, that means. I mean, 36-year-old James do the same thing. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But an example for just a specific example... Kenopanishad, Shrotrasya Shrotram Manaso Manoyad Vacho Havacham Sagu Pranasya Pranaha. It is the ear of the ear, the eye of the eye, the mind of the mind, the prana of the prana. Mm. What? Mm. I mean, imagine you just read that, as you said, 19 year old James. Mm. Ear of the ear, eye of the eye, ear, mind of the mind, pranas of the prana. What? What? And there's, it's not that it's within a thought. There's no explanation. You understand? Right, like, right. It's like, and then the next verse is exactly. In other words, no, no, what I'm saying is. No, yeah, the next verse will be like another one just like that. Another one like that. The Upanishads per se definitely need some help to 
they, it doesn't need help. We need help mm -hmm. to translate it, which is um, uh, what the masters um, offer. There's another one that he says, uh, those people that are attached to the um, world are in blinding darkness or in great darkness. Mm. But those people that are uh, engaged in the spiritual life are in the greatest darkness. Wow. So you're like, cool, I'm reading the Upanishads. I'm being spiritual. I'm not reading People magazine. Good for me. Wait, what? <laughs> what? Right. Why did it just say that if reading People magazine, I'm, I'm in darkness, but reading this, I'm in the greatest darkness. What is this? You know, uh, it, it does all this kind of stuff. It flips and twists. And, and what's so cool is you really cannot predict where it's going to go. It, no, yeah, yeah, you can't. It, but it makes perfect sense once it's translated. Right. Once it, the work has been done by the, the translator, the one who knows the language, who is talking from experience, which is the spiritual master, in our case, Swamiji, then you're like, oh, yeah, it makes perfect sense. The Upanishad, yeah, I know what Isavashi Upanishad says. <laughs> but it's well, only because you're told by someone who can translate it. Well, the, with the, uh, and I, I'll never pretend to know what the, uh, the Kano Upanishad was saying until I know it. But I remember coming across that verse when I was 34. And, and like you said, just ear of the ear, eye of the eye, mind of the mind. And being like, okay, I, I trust there's something here, but I certainly don't see it. Mm. And, and then it was, uh, over the last two years of constellations of other thoughts and obviously the context uh, given by Swami, but then a constellation of other thoughts that to what we've chatted about before might have already been in the head of that 30-year-old student 8,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. They would have already gotten those constellations growing oh, yeah. up. So much. But for us, we wouldn't, like maybe the, the, you know, the greatest darkness, they would have heard that at 16 19 24 then they're studying with a, a master at 25 yeah. and they've already had these thoughts developing for us obviously not so much so it's but it is it is these constellation of things where i got to tell you i had a experience yesterday i'll tell you separately but mm. um or maybe later in the conversation that ties to that specific line from the kano upanishad and by the way it's kano upanishad or kane upanishad when you combine it it's kana Upanishad, uh -huh. when you combine the, let's say the A and the U, it becomes O. Okay. So it's Kano Upanishad. Sanskrit's like math. It's like numbers. You can stick words together. You can move them around. <laughs> they don't, they don't make, they don't have to be in a certain order. Yeah. It's quite, it's i uh, I've heard, I don't know. You might've heard of it. They use Sanskrit. They say it's like the ideal tech language for some, some kind of programming, something, something. It's very mathematical. Right. You can move like pieces. It's highly rational. Not that I understand how all of it, but yes, that's called Sunday. When the words are mixed mm. together, they um, the where they join um, changes. So okay. Kena Upanishad becomes Kano Upanishad. Mm. Well, with the Kano Upanishad, there's uh, in that in that line, it's honestly like another constellating point I remember you telling me there's an Upanishadic line where uh, there's a devotee saying um, to the divine please remove the disc of the sun so, oh, yeah. so that I can see Isavasi Upanishad yeah it's yeah, what, amazing yeah. and what is the line there I mean uh, roughly he's, he, he's saying remove thy disc remove the, the he's talking to Brahman as it were to the ultimate Mm. as it were and he's saying remove the the shiny the shiny covering i want to see your your actual form mm. your actual self minus the 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 shine right. of the sun it's mm. crazy yeah. right so that and these little constellations build over time <clears> to <throat> where there's some semblance of connection but that's for listeners just a perfect example where there's so many contextual points needed that one has to assemble in 2022, especially from the West, mm -hmm. to try to glean the meaning from from these terse texts and the Upanishads. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then, uh, sorry for the uh, digression, but then okay. you have the the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita comes along as it it um, it clarifies the. Um, it, I wouldn't say clarifies so much as uh, elaborates. For example, in the Upanishads, he'll just say, do karma. He'll be like, okay, uh, med- uh, focus on the self. First line. Okay, focus on the self. Don't do anything else. Literally, don't do anything else. Just focus on the self. You're done. <laughs> if you can't, then he's like, if you can't do that, one of the Upanishads, he's like, if you can't just focus on the self, capital S, then... Uh, Meditate single-pointedly on a mantra. Okay. <laughs> if you can't do that, uh, spend all your time in study and reflection upon the concepts. If you can't do that, do something. Finally, he's like, if you can't do any of it, do karma. Actually, that's not even the last thing. <laughs> the last thing is like, if you can't even do that, then just do whatever you want and try to remember occasionally <laughs> the mm-hmm. highest. You know, He goes all the way down. But anyway, at some point in the... Uh, Upanishad in that particular Upanishad he just says do karma one word he means do action but there's so much in that one word that is okay he means do karma but he he means do action that's service oriented that's non-result oriented that's serving an ideal beyond yourself that is liberating you from your selfish desire blah, blah, blah. all that's there so but in the Upanishad he just says do karma because as you said the person who is he's speaking to is so prepared for the Upanishadic lessons. They've left their home, they've left their everything without any guarantee of even finding a master. It's not like they emailed them before and be like, I'll be arriving here and like, please check me into the visitor's department at the cave. Like, mm, it's, right. No joy, it's not happening. You know, They go and they're gone and most of them never come back. They give up their name, they give up their possessions, they give up, they don't talk about their past. I've met certain people in India myself who I've tried to get them to talk to me about anything before the day in which I'm talking to them, and they will refuse. Absolutely refuse. I, I don't talk about the past. They'll tell, they've will tell. they told me that, like quite esteemed people that I've met who just refuse. So the, that level of sacrifice and preparation, these people go in, for them, in the Upanishadic days, also just living in a more pure, classical, spiritually oriented culture. We're talking about 5,000 years ago and ancient india you know they're not uh they're, they're a different frequency of people in general so all that preparation he can look at that student and just say do karma and that that meant that's good for them that's what they need to hear but in the gita 2500 years later there's an entire chapter chapter three on karma yoga on what karma is that so that one word in the upanishads becomes a full chapter in the gita 2000 years later and the Gita, the Gita is not the only elaboration of the Upanishads. It all comes from the Upanishads. So there's so many great textbooks out there. Um, so many highly respected authoritative texts that are nothing but elaborations of the Upanishads. Is the Ashavakra uh, Gita, is that a, a contemporary Gita or some in that same lineage of here's an exposition on the terse Upanishads? yeah. yeah. It's an it's an example of a an elaboration, and the other thing is with time, like Ashtavakara, Janaka, like hmm, exactly who they were, when they were, and all that gets a bit foggy. Um, in, but yeah, Viveka Chudamani, the Brahma Sutras. There, there, there's so many texts that are that are elaborations of the core Upanishadic concepts. Um, two side questions. One, what happened? What is happening to the culture in that twenty five hundred years? To the best of your knowledge, I know it's you're not a historian, but mm. um, no one's it, a historian of India. Yeah, yeah, great point. There's no such thing. I mean, people have tried. Right, I, I've read. I've tried to read a few, you know, comprehensive histories of the subcontinent. Like, psh, no. Yeah, it defies that. It defies it completely. Eight thousand languages. Also, because kingdoms. it wasn't really. There's not that much value in keeping records. That's something that is so fascinating. Just they don't care culturally. Like what it what this is. It's all revolu- It's all cycles uh, and illusory. It, it, yeah, so and illusory. Like culturally speaking, they're like they don't 
really bother that much you right. know um historically i'm sure there are a lot of people now that are trying to go back and put together stories but it's very not western in that way mm. it's like it's in the past you know it's a and illusory to begin with and, and illusory to begin with and the world is not the value so why even record these things and it gets all tied up with myth really quickly it all gets absorbed into the these myths that are constantly evolving but anyway, go ahead. We'll, well, we'll attempt to yes. put our finger in the in the soup. Yeah, the, somewhere. Well, and you're. I think it's in this vein of these broad strokes orientation. It, I think you're as good as as an expert, at least in this conversation, yeah. to to give some um, some orientation of what's happening in the culture during those twenty five hundred years or five thousand years, because there's no no real you know, dates here hmm. from the Vedas to the Gita, but also culturally Hinduism strikes me as layers and layers of culture built on top of the Vedas. But in many ways, Vedanta is a return to the simplicity of the Upanishads without. Vedanta is the, sup the simplicity of the Upanishads. Mm -hmm. It's not a return. Mm. It is that. Vedanta is talking about the essential philosophy that is the Upanishads. That's it. Now, we may have returned to it or not, but Vedanta's right. been there the whole time. Right. You know, it's not that it's like a new interpretation. This is like uh, down to Vedanta Treatise, which is Swamiji's book, his magnum opus. That book attempts to capture the bare truths of Vedanta in one book in English, from the basic, most basic ideas to the most complex start. So whatever is contained in the entire wisdom tradition that we're talking about called Vedanta from thousands of years, Swamiji modestly <laughs> attempted and has done a, I mean, you know for yourself, an incredible piece of work to produce a book where you can read all, what is it actually saying? If you take that 5,000 year old wisdom tradition, just squeeze it out. What's the essence? Mm. Vedanta treatise. That's the, that's what that book is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. So that you don't have to go through all this. You don't even really have to know all the history. You don't have to try to figure out which books and lineages and gurus and whatever. You just want to be like, okay, I just want to know what it said. What is, what is that tradition saying? And that's that's Vedanta treatise, and that book is, uh, you know, almost a full year of the three year course at the ashram, because mm -hmm. I mean, there's there's no book that has the entire uh, knowledge from the Upanishads till present day in one in one text like that. It's mm -hmm. unbelievable in a way that makes sense. And now we just read it and we're like, yeah, Vedanta treatise, like okay, to to it's like an iPhone or something. It seems so simple. But to no, actually no. make to, it simple, to make it do that is to, to make it simple, to make it um, so comprehensive. Mm. He worked on that book for 20 years. Right. Know? After he was a master. Oh, yeah. After he's a master. Then... Only a master could do that. Right. Who else could do that? Who else could conceive that? Who else could take that on with, uh, with confidence? You know, I mean, this right. is what Vedanta is. So, yeah. in other words, people can read that book now and not have a clue about the Upanishads, about the Gita, about India, about any tradition having anything to do with the culture of India and have it totally make sense and take them all the way to self-realization. Hmm. That's the idea. A guy can pick it up on a bookshelf in America with no interest, no, never be, even eaten Indian food. The guy doesn't care. He doesn't even like Indian food. you know. And still he can use it to go to the highest state that a human being is is heir to it's pretty phenomenal yeah it's a, it's like in curling is it curling yeah. the little ice yeah yeah puck thing yeah 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 the brushing brushing yeah and, and letting go or and we're we're constantly saying in these episodes and and in yfy encouraging if anyone is two three five episodes in just kind of like now go past us mm. and dive right into Vedanta Treatise. Yeah. Or dive into your classes, mm. dive into um, the online learning, the online lectures that are just on there. It's 
uh, ashram in your pocket uh, at yfy.co. But getting people off of us and onto that, and that's a great yeah. call out for Vedanta Treatise where the appreciation, it's, it was you know, like you hear a beautiful song and it moves you. The appreciation of what went into it was years after just understanding he was already a, went from scholar to master, self-realized to spending um, seven years to write, then 14 years additionally to edit and, and refine it, 21 years and written by a great legal mind because he was trained as a lawyer in England. So written in English for... Uh, an audience he understood, a really, global audience he understood well. It wasn't just a scholar in a corner of the uh, Indian subcontinent that didn't know the world. No, no. It was, and he was, and he was extremely cosmopolitan. Yes, was a householder to begin with. It wasn't like he always says, says he'll be like, "Hey, Joe, have you been to?" Uh, I don't know Boise, and uh, I'll be like, "No, Swamiji, I've been to more of America than you have." <laughs> he's like, he's like, he says it to all of us. I'm just making yeah. it personal, but you guys haven't even seen the world. You don't know anything about Brahmin. You don't know anything about the world. You don't know anything about anything. You guys, anyway, whatever. Who am I talking to? I don't know. Who, I can't talk to chairs. So I'll, I'll just talk to you guys. Yeah, <laughs> just like the man's and uh, worldly to a level beyond anybody. Like, how can you? six international trips a year for 40 years mm. and not like staying you know secluded in, in, in hotels but yeah. like in people's homes you know which for is three like weeks oh i mean and giving talks you stay in people's homes all over the world like you that man knows so much more about the world so to your point that mm. it's it's not um it's just remarkable it's a remarkable masterpiece and you couldn't have a more uh, remarkable master to put it together mm -hmm. also. It's it's just amazing. I remember the first time I got that book, uh, Vedanta Treatise. And with, the, by the way, this yeah. isn't overselling. This is just the... Oh, no, uh, just the, celebrating it. Yes. As we <laughs> yeah. should, as we should. Right. The first time I read Vedanta Treatise um, was the, the, the evening after I met Swami. The first time in 96 in uh, St. Louis. Um, uh Amma, who you love, his wife, um, was w traveling with him, and she handed me Vedanta treatise. After he he called her and said, "Give this this boy's interested. Give him one of those books." You know, <laughs> so the old Vedanta treatise. I don't know if you've even seen it. It's kind of like a light brown, and anyway, I'll, I'll show you one day. It's kind of a yellow. Um. Anyway, I went home, and I'd been studying. Eastern philosophy for a few years, pretty heavily, and was the, a few a few months, kind of three to six months into kind of starting to explore India and Indian stuff through this one class I was taking, and but it was just so I, I remember what it's like to have all these ideas just kind of all over the place floating around, and how does that connect to this and this and Buddha said this and. This guy said this, and now Lao Tzu said this. Lao Tzu and, yeah. and the Upanishads are saying this, and this Gita thing. And I, I remember, I remember, well, like, like viscerally, what that felt like, you know. And and just kind of there, there's like almost a, not a, almost like a desperation. Like I need this to like come together. I want all this to just lock and in, fall into place and understand. And then that book is handed to me. And I mean, this is pre-Google, there's no Wikipedia, there's no, ex there's like whatever I can find in the library, you know, like those days, you know. And um, I sat down and read that book cover to cover, no joke, and I've never done this before. That evening, I sat down and read it cover to cover, finished it, went back to page one and read it again. And I mean, I can't say that I've ever done that with a book before or since because it was just so ridiculously clear it was so ridiculously uh organized that after that it was just like a key it was like someone gave me a key to understand all this stuff that i'd been interested in and in, and in studying and and my god nowadays 
nowadays there's so much information out there and people that are interested in this anyone listening to this is probably watching multiple podcasts and all kinds of youtube channels and stuff and they i'm sure they're having that feeling i'm just like there's these ideas everywhere i don't know really what it, everything is what is what is it actually saying over there in india or in the eastern world or whatever what is it what's the message mm. they'll have the same experience that they read vedanta treatise it becomes a key that after that Anything you read makes perfect sense. It's, it lays this deep underlying foundation um, for understanding all of it. It's incredible. Yeah, there's a, there was a similar experience for me with, with loving these like all-star questioners of Alan Watts and Ram Dass and even Terrence McKenna. They were like my, and they still, I love <clears throat> jumping into an episode on YouTube in the afternoon going for a run. It's, I mean, these are true titans of Western thinkers questioning what we are given, what we're handed, what we're uh, beaten with, mm. uh, with these concepts in, in the West and just some varying concepts that are given out in the East. And it's so fascinating. Like, it's like just being in the zoo of like, especially someone is erudite and, and articulate as Alan Watts. It was almost like a an incredible journalist of these different traditions. Yeah. And it's and it is so much fun to just recognize, wow, there are universes mm. of of brilliant, beautiful thought that speaks to me deep down mm, mm, mm. that are different than what you are handed uh, to us, you know, in the, at least from my experience growing up in, in the U.S., mm. 90s and early 2000s. And, and there's, but then after a while, like you go around the zoo a handful of times and to your point, there's, there's this experience of, okay, I don't see how these really connect. And I want to go from watching a bird fly to understanding flight mm. because an implicit message in watching mm. This bird flies that I can fly as well, but I mm. certainly mm -hmm. wouldn't trust myself to jump mm -hmm. off any ledge because I do not understand how it works. Yeah, yeah. And I'm I'm a little bit over just seeing others do it and in seeing uh, kind of these brief um, views of of whether it's yeah Buddha or uh, Buddhism or which I won't go into much of my life history, but that mm. was a great line of uh philosophy growing up in our household and yet uh i i did i was like i want to go deep three mm. inches wide mm. and or three inches deep and a mile wide mm. really want to go deep and it was around kind of this thought of like okay i'm getting some of these messages but what is the method mm -hmm. i'm ready for the method mm -hmm. uh and and so and i similarly picked up an treatise in a drawer at a hotel at uh, the calamagus resort and was uh, was yeah, I was pretty uh, enraptured by it. Mm. So okay, so the the hmm. Gita twenty five hundred years ago, um, and and again, it's it's for people clicking on this episode on the history of Vedanta, you'll probably quickly um, become a little more fascinated in not necessarily the history, but the compendium of these thoughts, which is in Vedanta treatise, um, which is maybe more so there than anything else out there in the yeah. world yeah but uh the so you have the gita 2500 years ago S where do the brahma sutras fit in and some people talk about that as 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 a canonical text within vedanta but w do you have any out of curiosity why is the academy why is vedanta academy uh, not give too much swamiji uh was trying to from whatever he said and again as you started at the top we don't <laughs> the best thing is to ask him why he set up the ashram the way he set up the ashram um but he, he what he often says is look i'm not interested in making you people scholars which is a big departure from the few uh there are other institutions teaching vedanta that it's much more about mastering 40 Upanishads and all of the books you've mentioned and so many more within like less time, right? So the way that the ashram has been structured 
Vedanta Academy has been structured by Swami Parthasarathy, our guru, is not to make us scholars. Not so that uh, it's not about um, being able to know or take the best guess at, at which books came when and which are more important and how long I'm quoting verses and all that stuff. And there are a lot of people who think that that's crucially important. Uh, Swamiji has told us over and over and over again, I'm not interested in making you people scholars. I'm interested in giving you the tools you need to move towards the self and realize it. So um, that's sort of just a background Mm. thing to understand about his approach and I, I don't know how many people that will even matter to because you kind of have to have an understanding of what's going on in India with ashrams and institutions and the whole thing which is way more than we can get into here but I will say that it's unique it's unique it's very um, I don't know minimalist in a certain way I don't know how to talk about that, but it's just very well, um, very uniquely conceived. Mm. The Vedanta Academy, Swamiji doesn't, doesn't, you can tell it doesn't matter to him or, or it was not his intention to make people, people be able to quote verses or to be able to talk about the history or any of that. He said, look, this is the information you need to understand what you are, what life is all about, and how to get to the highest state of consciousness that you can. In, which is called self-realization. And also, how much time, right? So uh, he's told us that for a while he played with having the course there be five years, in which case he might have added a couple of more of the books that you've mentioned. Um, but he thought five years, tell people, because it's, it's 365, it's seven days a week. There's no holidays, no vacations. When I first went to India, I was there for three and a half years. I didn't come home. I didn't. I called home once in six months. It was gone, you know. And uh, if that had been five years, how many people would go? How many people would be willing to? Although a lot of people end up staying because after three years, they're like, "I want another couple of years." Mm. But if he had made it five years from the beginning, it might have been prohibitive. It's a, it sounds like a big chunk of your life mm. to people. So it was. The way that Swamiji has described it in his conception of the ashram is a place where he can give people the tools, not to make them scholars, but to give them the tools they need to live the knowledge, to become wiser and ultimately self-realized. And within a time frame that isn't too short, like you need a certain amount of time to, to, to have that separation from the world, as it were, to think and reflect and work on all of this. But not too long to where it uh, it's prohibitive. So in there somewhere um, is is the truth. The way he's he's talked to us about it anyway. Mm. The and and goes without saying he even to write Vedanta treatise. I remember you telling me it was it's like fifty different Upanishads being woven in. So it's. It is. He's he, doing. He's a master of all that, right? Yeah, he's a master of all that. Um, and uh, that way, uh, Swami often says, "He's like you guys may beat me, and he's he's funny like that. He'll be like, you guys may beat me in this aspect of the of the of whatever teaching. You may be a better teacher than me. You may be able to organize better events or whatever." He's like, "But none of you will beat me as a student." Mm. <laughs> Which is true. I mean, it's crazy. There are pictures of him with 20 books and there's pens on every one marking pages and stuff. So all the Upanishads and the Brahma Sutras and Viveka Chudamani and the Panchadasi and all the Prakriyas and all the Puranic literature and all that stuff, um, the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, all, I mean, he knows all that pit pat. That's where the surrender comes into the master, you know. He's like, you can spend your life qualifying yourself to read to write Vedanta treatise like I did this is Swami talking or get to the it's been done for you mm. you know and um, he always says he's like gosh if I had had this book that you people have I would have rocked the world mm. I'm only quoting him now so I'm not um, I'm not projecting yeah. I really don't want to project what I think Swamiji's 
understanding and state is, like you said at the beginning, but I'm just directly quoting. He's like, if I had the Vedanta treatise that you guys have as a tool, I would have rocked the whole world. He says that all the time. But he's like, but I had to, somebody had to write it. Mm. So he had to make that his focus um, and intention. And uh, yeah, we don't all have to go through all that, uh, all those iterations and all of that, that groundwork that he did because it's done for us. Now use it. That's the point. If you put in the same effort to understand and work with and apply and, and onboard the messaging of Vedanta Treatise that he put into creating it, uh, we a self-realized soul. That's the, that's the promise of the book. I think he even says it in there somewhere. One of the books. If you master this, it's more than enough information. In fact, even one Upanishad, if you understand fully, you're done. Even one verse of the Gita, if you understand it fully down to the bottom of it. So it's, it's uh, this is important in talking about the ashram. It's not about breadth of knowledge. It's about depth. Everyone wants breadth of knowledge. Everyone's so interested in hearing what the next guy said in the next book and how it compares to this and compares to that. And it's super uh intellectually satisfying to do that mm -hmm. it's really irresistible i mean it's very enticing it's so fascinating to understand how that upanishad connects to this and maybe this. but when you actually break it down you're like wait all i'm getting excited about is this idea mm -hmm. so rather than getting lost in all of this intellectual puzzle making and and puzzle undoing which is really uh enticing he says get to the actual message and reflect on it to the bottom of it that's mm -hmm. the that's the emphasis which is really um really unique and the opposite of kind of the academic approach to spirituality mm -hmm. well it's and it's a great uh, segue to basically rounding out this <clears throat> conversation of history because it is it will be fascinating to folks i know in my previous lives there's a fascination with how does it orient to uh, thoughts and and schools of thought around it um but then there is to what we touched on then there is this this uh appetite of like okay i've i've been around the zoo mm -hmm. now i really really want to go deep it's not about entertainment yeah uh, and once you have the depth you don't you lose a taste for it I have a degree in South and East Asian religion. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like from Wash U in St. Louis. I'm not like tooting my horn, but I mean. It's one of the top schools in the world. I mean, like Houston Smith. I think it's like a top 10 school in the world. Yeah. And I mean, Houston Smith uh, uh, was like, was there. He basically invented comparative religion. I mean, him and Joseph Campbell and a few others. But I mean, I, I know that how fascinating it is. It's so fascinating, but and I and I, I was fully into that myself. It's so interesting to understand the Zen versus this versus this versus then this guy and this guy and how it connects in a slightly different angle and and then it all fades into it all becomes so inconsequential when you begin to work with the depth of any one of those ideas. Um, it's so different. It's so much more deeply satisfying. Otherwise, it's just on the surface. You kind of, as you said, you 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 kind of learn what can be learned. You know, you learn what all about what can be known, what can be experienced. And you're wow. It's so, at some point you stop and you're like, well, wait, I, I'd rather know for myself what mm -hmm. these guys are talking about. I'd rather experience for myself what these guys are talking about. This is a different thing. Wanting to learn to live the knowledge, it immediately just takes the color out of the the um, the purely intellectual exploration. Mm. Well, and to and, and a great after this episode or right now, feel free to pause this and 
dive into Vedanta treatise. It's uh, you know the ebook. You could have it instantaneously. It is crazy mm. how mm. how uh, just fingertip away we are from this this information. You do not need to go to the Himalayas. It's not pronounced Himalayas. Um, mm. You do not need to uh, you know buy buy cart and camel get there it's not a thousand years ago it's not 200 years ago where a great book like even 50 years ago you you hear alan watts be like i had to find this book at this bookstore in berlin mm. it's just it's on your phone right now yeah this conversation pause boom yeah. you yeah. jump you can jump right into it and i can give you a little bit of a of an overview that the first third of the book will feel like it's like the engine getting ready so it's not gonna it's not gonna feel too crazy it's gonna feel like okay these are things that it's like a rocket ship where the engine's just getting ready it's starting up then the second second third of the book uh for me kind of it's it felt like all right the engine's starting to take off but i'm still of the world this is still kind of like okay Mm. this is really crystal clear Mm. uh, thought flow Mm. Mm. um but I've heard parts of this before, but I, this is a great articulation of this. Mm. And then the third section of the book is like you enter, you leave the atmosphere and you're just like, whoa. Yeah. The last uh, three chapters, really 19, 20, 21, the whole book is leading up to it. Mm. So and that's totally, yeah, it's orbit. Right. So feel free to uh, map to that as you, as you dive into it again, so wild that it, you just buy it on your phone or your tablet computer right now. But also the physical version is really great for making Yeah, notes. and the audio version is amazing. Swami reads the book to you, yeah. which is nice. It's a nice thing. Right. And e-learning, of course, is the ultimate thing, uh, which is on yfyi.co. Yeah. You, could, yeah, you, you can have it taught to you by Swamiji. Yeah. It's like ridiculous. From your pocket. I, it's well, amazing, yeah. Talk about don't take anything for granted. It is it is so wild. It's a damn near miracle. It is a miracle. In fact, you someone healing my broken arm by touching mm, me mm. versus here's an ashram in your pocket. Mm, mm, mm. And you can study with this master daily Yeah, from your bedroom. Yeah, is I would take that all day long. Oh, um, yeah, sure. Give me, give me the broken arm. The, the um, to round out the conversation of this uh, academic kind of historicity of Vedanta, uh, maybe point out where I might be wrong as I learn and as I have answered this for for other folks. You have the Upanishads and then around the same time as Lord Buddha creates uh, his own distillation of what has kind of become layered in cruft culture of of rituals and mythology and um, kind of an ornate nature built on top of the philosophy. At the same time, you have the Gita uh, written about the the same time that also distills it down to a forty five minute conversation um, between a uh, this warrior prince and the and his charioteer, um, and it, it symbolic of the conversation that we have within our just. The battle within our own hearts, the convers- the questions we have, and you have this discourse that distills it down to like, you don't need all of these other layers, levels, mm-hmm. um, kind of like Christ coming five hundred years later and saying, you don't need this entire culture mm-hmm. of uh, Judaism to get to the core of the truth. W- side note is one of the things that I love about Vedanta, similar to Christianity, is that it is a critique on culture, um, more so than it is a culture, uh, Judaism being a culture, Islam being a culture, Hinduism in many ways being a culture. And then you have Vedanta, you have uh, uh, teaching of, teachings of Christ, uh, teachings of Lord Buddha that are basically like cutting through mm. the culture and saying, mm. here is a distillation of, of It's the, of the truth. philosophy. The mm. philosophical truths stripped of all of the blind faith, mechanical ritual, superstitious beliefs, mm. stripped of really all the cultural aspects. Not that it should be. We're not saying that it doesn't, uh, this is not to 
uh, make make light or or make less of the cultural importance of the cultural um, format to be around it. That that's useful. That keeps the whole thing together. But the essential philosophy, the essential ideas, that's that's what we mean when we're talking about Vedanta. And you're right; it's there in all in all these traditions. There's there. There's the fundamental worldview that's being offered, and then all around it gets built these, you know, cultural sort of surroundings that are good. Mm. They're conducive. They're they are conducive to get your thoughts back onto that thing. Yeah, growing up in Texas, the Bible Belt, it was a very conducive environment, community of there's something beyond yourself. Sure, yeah. but then you get to the point where you want to find what that is. Uh, yeah. The and and maybe a more conducive um, path to to get there, at least in my experience, Vedanta has been that. And so you have, and I remember hearing it described as if as if uh, there's like a high pressure, low pressure, where when there is a recognition that culturally there we would benefit from a return to the philosophy, mm-hmm. to the direct mm-hmm. truth. Mm-hmm. A master presents it to us, like mm. uh, you have Vyasa and mm. Gita. You've got um, Lord Buddha, Christ. You have then we have Shankaracharya, like around 800 AD. That seems to, and then again, you Krishna. You have Krishna. You have uh, these masters that come and and recognize, and I guess in this um, really academic and and hopefully just to serve that orientation in people's minds for where does Vedanta fit in. In this chronology, you have someone like Shankaracharya is around 800 AD mm. that comes in and again tries to distill um, the philosophy mm-hmm. and revive Vedanta at least as a term, as a, uh, as a, as a uh, mm. direct path mm. uh, from, again, the culturalization or the cultural layers that get built um, and we actually studied some Shankaracharya in in e-learning. Do you want to talk a little bit about Shankaracharya or that time period of, of uh, those texts? Yeah, he, he was an uh, exceptional master that um, uh, brought about um, commentaries on the, uh, they're called Bhashyas, commentaries on some of the Upanishads, um, on the Gita, on the uh, Prakriyas, the, the Bhajagovindam and Atma Bodha are two of the books that we study. Um, so yeah, he, he just, uh, not just, he, he did deeply clarify and, and um, highlight and organize the uh, essential teachings of Vedanta. In Advaita and Vedanta, in in particular, and and at that time, I mean, it's, there's so much going on in all that period. But there are different schools that had gone different ways and emphasizing different interpretations of things. And he really um, brought it, the focus back on Advaita Vedanta, on on non-dual Vedanta. Mm-hmm. But uh, he was also an exceptional uh, influence on. Uh, the devotional side of things. He wrote tremendous amounts of uh, bhajans, devotional songs, and other uh, compositions, poetry, and all kinds of things. And he was an exceptional karma yogi also. Uh, Shankaracharya is like, a, to, to do all three at that level is just just unprecedented. You know, so that he's definitely a watermark, a, a, a point along the, the history of the tradition that is extremely highly revered. And so anything that Shankaracharya commented on or elaborated upon and stuff was like, that's minted, that mm. that's legit. That There are Upanishads that he commented upon and Upanishads that he didn't, and they're not seen as the same value. Mm. you know because of that so uh, or value i don't know what the right word is the the they're, they're not seen as with the same authoritativeness um but yeah beyond that there's a lot more to know about him i'm sure a lot more but 
Well, and for the listeners that want to hear a little bit more about him, we can check out the three yogas or one of our previous episodes. Yeah. And, and then to round it out, you have um, folks like Vivekananda and, and then Ramatirtha at the turn of the 20th century, so about 120 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, incredible contributions made and even swami saying ramatirtha mm-hmm. is his real guru mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. and and but never wrote a book gave amazing lectures here in america actually as well mm-hmm. um but uh began writing a book uh, before passing away at 33 but is seen as this titan of uh vedanta contributions even in that short life mm-hmm. and and then you have swami with as I think you told me recently, there wasn't uh, there hasn't been a compendium of, of Vedanta written down in one text in 500 years. There hasn't there's never been one in English mm. um, like Vedanta treatise. So it's it's uh, that is another uh, nod towards Vedanta treatise, but also uh, Swami, yeah, reviving the term Vedanta uh, to what you rightly mentioned. Vedanta doesn't need to be reviving. It doesn't need reviving. But the term Vedanta, I remember him saying for 10 years, the first, the, you know, the work was just 10 years getting people to call it Vedanta instead of Vendanta. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Vedanta just meaning the end of the Vedas, which we touched on the very beginning of the conversation, as well mm, as mm. Uh, Vedas being knowledge. So mm. end of knowledge. Mm. The That reviving of the term Vedanta is still very much in the the early innings, mm, um, mm. even even you know getting past mm. Vedanta to Vedanta. Mm. It's still a term that I know friends of mine, a friend I was at dinner with uh, on Saturday, just saying I've never heard anyone besides you have never heard the term Vedanta. So it's uh, very it's much amazing, yeah. very much in the early innings of this. <laughs> revival of it's the, really uh, remarkable yeah and that's why it's vedanta academy and that's why the book is vedanta treatise and that's why all of my nonprofit is vedanta institute houston and you know there's vedantaworld.org which swamiji said we're all trying to keep that word vedanta in the in the foreground out of curiosity does why some schools will, will call out the advaita a non-dual meaning uh, Sanskrit for non-dual, but uh, but Swami doesn't. No, he does. I mean, he clearly talks about it being Advaita, but not in the in the. I don't know. It's shorthand, I guess you could say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if we're as you write as you're saying, Vedanta is enough. I there are people who've known me for twenty years that still say, "Are you still doing that Ven, Vendada?" I'm like, "Yeah, I'm still doing Vendada." Mm-hmm. What are you doing? <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> Vendetta, Vendata. V- you know so to add advaita to that it just probably <laughs> swami was like all right is enough uh one two or two dolls on the table we don't want to confuse these people you know right, what I mean? right. advaita vedanta like, are you speaking which language are you speaking now you mm-hmm. know so at least vedanta they can mistake for vendetta or vendata yeah know, advaita how it, but i don't know i don't know why well, he's it, emphasized and in that that uh, kind of you actually see the need for a book like Vedanta treatise or Vedantic kind of streamline philosophy again because we do see even in the last especially in the last 30 40 years this proliferation of the cruft coming back of non-dualism to and it's borrowed and taken into some realm we touched on uh this in in one of our clubhouse chats of just you see a new age wisdom talking about having a little bit of the message mm. but missing the the method and saying mm. things that mm. can be quite destructive or s- stagnating to your your spiritual path like just sit and meditate mm. or you are it you don't mm. have to do anything mm. It's just realizing you're it, and then then you're done. Mm-hmm. Um, get a mantra, and then stick with this, and then you're done. Mm-hmm. There is nothing to do. Mm-hmm. You're you're done before you even tried to do anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there is a distillation that I feel like as we, I guess, wrap this episode with, um, 
you know, in many ways, Vedanta gets described in the, the Vedas being the source of Eastern philosophy. And you have Hinduism built on top of it. Then you have Buddhism as basically Hinduism made for export as it mm. enters China in a much simplified, mm. much more simplified way. Mm. Zen being a derivation, by the way. Mm. I'm just yapping away hmm. waiting for you to be like no that's not correct no no i'm with um, you you're correct yeah and then zen being obviously a derivation of that is it enters japan hmm. zen enters the u.s primarily because japan becomes such a massive economic force in the 20 in the 21st century or in the 20th century hmm. that we start to take notice of what's the philosophy behind this hmm. economic force hmm. in the 40s 50s 60s 70s 80s hmm. so america becomes fascinating we've chatted about this a little bit of why is america so fascinated with zen and that being a very big it's our capitalistic kind of like let's understand a system so that we can gain more yeah. wiring yeah in which zen becomes uh very hip and cool in the 80s uh 70s 80s in the u.s but now i feel like we're at this point where vedanta is going to be the philosophy of the world in a hundred years because for those not you know watching joseph is kind of smiling but the reason i feel strongly about that is i feel like with the the propagation of so much information in our pockets yeah we're all going to go through this path of the zoo mm -hmm. of like oh these zen phrases oh these koans are so cool this uh, uh well these, to, to to jump in then yeah and, please we will all go through all of these the zoo the tiny percentage that's actually interested in thinking about any of this will mm. go through the zoo but it's not the whole world the whole how many people care in the first place about any of these questions yeah one in so 10, so it's only <laughs> it's only of those who are philosophically inclined the world is going to continue going on doing exactly what it's doing Mm. as it's doing it till the end mm. till the bitter end but yeah for those who are interested in in any any sort of philosophical religious spiritual understanding whatever it is then yeah vedanta will become more prominent <laughs> but I, not the whole world right yes maybe not the whole world but i not even it, close as an investor in technology is just looking at trends yeah i see the trend of the the switched on mind mm. finding the honeypot of vedanta uh more and more because it is it well it is the original and it is the the complete it is so damn complete um and obviously with things like vedanta treatise it's it is so and i'm i'm preaching to the preacher not even the choir right now but mm. there is this viewpoint that the world is getting stranger faster. Mm -hmm. Not just that the world is strange, but the world from 2010 to 2022 is so radically stranger than the world from you know 2000 to 2010. Mm -hmm. And it's only going to accelerate that this level of swirl and whiplash mm. um, that humans have just never seen the amount of information that is hitting us mm. daily, like mm. compare that to someone in a village 200 years ago, mm. Mm. you know, outside of Prague. Now that same 15 year old outside of Prague with a phone mm. is hit with so much mm. every hour mm. that there's going to become this, this point in time where we're all going to have to surrender to this hurricane of change mm. around us. And, and that surrender for many of these switched on individuals thinking about philosophy, thinking about uh, spirituality, they're, I think they're going to find this depth, this oasis, uh, this completeness in Vedanta that, that they won't find elsewhere. Mm. And it's going to become more of their infotainment mm. than you know, they're going to choose to listen to alan watts talk about the taboo against knowing taboo of of knowing who you are mm. instead of watching a hundred million dollar netflix movie with will smith 
Mm-hmm. And that's a that's a a trend that I see coming that you I don't know if many of us would have saw that coming mm. uh, ten years ago. Well, Vedanta is there for them, for those who want who want to know, and it always has been just waiting, sitting there, mm. and there are people making it available to the world as their as their cause in life. So there you go. It's there. Great way to end an episode of YFYI. And if you're one of those people clicking on an episode of YFYI and not not out of any sense of like duty or or shouldness, because there are no shoulds and shouldn'ts mm. in Vedanta. Mm. But if you're clicking on it instead of clicking on the I don't know, Tom Cruise Apple TV movie, out of genuine interest, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, because yeah. it's that's who we're making these for. So thank you, Joseph. Thanks, bro.